Hi, my name is JP and I'm one of the pastors at ECC. We're happy to provide this resource and hope that the Lord uses this teaching from His Word to build you up in the faith. We would encourage you not to use a sermon video as a substitute for gathering regularly with the local church. We would love for you to be committed to brothers and sisters in the city, state, and country where you live, and it's our hope that this teaching would encourage faithfulness on your part towards the body of Christ where you live. Well, good morning. Would you please turn in your Bibles uh, to the book of Judges, chapter 6. We're resuming our series through Judges this morning, and I would request you to turn to Judges, chapter 6. We'll be looking at chapters 6 and 7 together today, and uh, as you turn there, I just want to say it's uh, great to be back preaching God's Word to you. Uh, I ask you to even pray for me as I preach that the Lord would sustain uh, my voice, and I just want to thank you all for, again, uh, your many encouragements and prayers over the last two weeks as I've been uh, recovering from the surgery I had a couple of weeks ago. Judges chapter 6, if you would uh, join me in prayer one more time. Heavenly Father, our gracious God, we come to you as you have called us, eager to hear your word, to hear you speak, O God of creation and God of covenant. We pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear this morning, that we would be broken and tremble at your word and fear only you and nothing else that you would cause us to behold your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, his glory shining out of the pages of Scripture into our hearts, that we might love him, adore him, and be more like him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. What do you fear? That's a great question. Uh, several years ago, uh, I was visiting the UAE, we were considering moving here, and I remember sitting uh, with a brother who is an elder of one of the churches in Dubai, and he sat across from the table, uh, across from me, and he asked me this question, what are your fears? I mean, if you look at surveys that are done of various phobias that people have, believe it or not, the number one phobia, most common among people, is the fear of public speaking. Past few weeks, I've been training some students in the Gulf Theological Seminary in uh, proclamation and public teaching. And yesterday, a couple of them gave their talks, and it was the first time they'd ever done it. <coughs> oh, yeah, it's a fearful thing. I'll tell you what my phobia is. I'm sorry if this is your profession, but my number one phobia is going to the dentist. I can tell you what my wife's number one phobia is. Uh, she's surprised. I never told her I'd do this. I think it's sitting next to her husband when he's driving. <laughs> we all have our phobias, but some of us, <clears throat> all of us, struggle with more serious phobias and fears. Fears that are not irrational, but that are real. The fear of the future. Fear of loss, the fear of failure. Oh, how the fear of failure grips so many of us. The fear of death. Can God use fearful people like us? How do we overcome fear? How can weak and fearful, frail, fragile Creatures of the dust become courageous for Christ and his cause. Well, this morning we're going to meet a fearful guy as we re-enter our series through the book of Judges in chapter 6. Our friend Gideon is a real coward. He's a scaredy cat. And as we look through his story... It's going to answer for us the questions. How do the cowardly become courageous? How do the fearful grow in confidence? 
We're going to go through our story today. The first half of Gideon's story, we'll be looking at Gideon's life in two sermons, this week and next week. Uh, first half of his story, we're going to look through in six scenes in chapters 6 and 7. Six scenes. And the first scene is this. The word that corrects. The word that corrects. This is in chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. Let me read verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And right there, the author is bringing us back to remind us of the structure of the book of Judges. You might remember, I told you the book of Judges had two introductions. We looked at those. It has two conclusions that correspond to the two introductions. And then we go through two cycles of major judges with three judges each. All right? So we've finished our first cycle of major judges. All right? And each of those is introduced with the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then you have the phrase, the people of Israel did again what was evil. Did you notice here in verse 1, the word again is not used. So the author is telling us this is a new cycle of major judges. We're going to see three major judges in this cycle. And guess what? All of these three major judges, Gideon, Jephthah, and Samson, they're far worse than their predecessors. All right? Things are getting worse in Israel. Things are getting darker as we enter the second round of the major judges in this book. And, of course, when you come to verse 1, we're seeing this repeated cycle. Remember the cycle of judges? Uh, you have disobedience, dis discipline from the Lord, distress. People of Israel cry out in distress. God enacts deliverance through a deliverer or a judge. And then they decline. So they've declined once again after the great deliverance that happened through Deborah and Barak. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Disobedience. Verse 1. How does God respond? He responds with discipline. Continue verse 1. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste the land as they came in. So there's a new enemy on the horizon now on the scene, Midian. This oppression is shorter. You might say, oh, God went easy on them this time. Only seven years. In previous times was longer. But this oppression is harder. It's a very intense seven years. Did you see how much it's described? They were reducing Israel to nothing. They were having a tough time. And, and notice how large and powerful Midian was. They were like locusts in abundance. Their camels were without number. And they would come in and raise the land. They would take all of the produce. They would take away Israel's very livestock. There's no way for Israel to survive. It's hard without livestock or sheep or ox or donkey in an agrarian society. There's no grain. They're taking all the produce. By the way, this is God's fulfillment of what he has already declared in the book of Deuteronomy. If you go back and read De Deuteronomy chapter 28 and read those covenant curses, God has said, if you disobey my voice, this is what will happen. And the author of Judges is showing us that the curses of the covenant are beginning to come upon the people of Israel because of their disobedience to God. In fact, the blessings of the covenant have been taken away from Israel and Midian is experiencing it. Things are going backwards. Did you notice that? They and their camels could not be counted. God promised Abraham, your offspring will not be counted. If you read chapter 7 and verse 12, it says, that they were like the sand on the seashore. That was what was promised to Abraham concerning his offspring. 
Israel is in covenant reversal now, and they're oppressed so heavily that they're hungry, they're hunted, and they're hiding. They're taking refuge in the caves and in the rocks and in the dens. Verse 6 sums it up. Israel was brought very low because of Midian. Oh, isn't that just such a great summary of where sin ultimately leads us? When we give ourselves to sin, and then when we face the consequences of sin, we are brought very low. The people of Israel disobey, disobedience. They experience God's discipline, and now they are in distress. And what do they do when they're in distress? The people of Israel were brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. So if you're familiar with the pattern, what are you expecting next? After their distress, deliverance, right? God usually raises up. If you look at the other judge accounts before this, it says, and God raised up a deliverer. Here comes the Savior. But no, this time there's a change. God doesn't immediately send them a savior. He first sends them a sermon. Before he gives them salvation, he gives them a sermon. Before he gives them salvation, he needs to give them a scolding. Before they can be saved from their situation, the Israelites need to see the reason for their situation. Look at verses 7 to 10. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell but you have not obeyed my voice. God reminds them of who he is and what he's done. Did you see again and again in verse 8, I led you up. Verse 9, I delivered you. Verse 10, I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. And then he reminds them of how they have responded. But you have not obeyed my voice. By the way, that's the second time that phrase appears in the book of Judges. We saw it back in chapter 2, didn't we? Where God says, you have not obeyed my voice. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden did not obey God's word, Israel have failed to obey God's voice. They have become deaf, just like the idols that they worship. Their suffering is because of their sin. Their main problem is not Midianite oppression. Their main problem is Israelite idolatry. And so often is it the case with us. Now, I want to be clear, friends. Suffering in the Christian life is not always because of sin. Often we can be suffering having done nothing wrong at all. And God, in his gracious providence, brings suffering into our life in his fatherly love and care for us in order to grow our faith and dependence upon him, in order to grow our character to be more like Christ. But sometimes, suffering and difficult situations in our lives are the result of sin. They are the discipline of God for our disobedience. And like Israel, our sin brings us very low. And then as we face those circumstances that are hard, as we face those trials, as we find ourselves in distress, we cry out and we want divine intervention. But first, what we need is divine instruction. We want often to have relief from our circumstances when what we need is a rebuke for our sin. We want God to comfort us in our distress when what we really need is correction for our disobedience. You know, I I love sometimes how Facebook memes communicate spiritual truth. I saw this meme yesterday and there's this this cartoon and there's this guy and he has another person tied up on a chair with a bag on their head and he's about to lift out lift off the bag and he says now I know all the reasons now I know what's causing uh, difficulty in my walk with Christ 
Now I know what's hindering my walk with Christ. And then the next pain, he takes off the bag and it's, it's himself. Friends, as you hear God's word today and as you sit under God's word each week and as you read your Bibles, ask the Lord to show you where you have failed to obey his voice. As you face suffering in your lives, as you face difficult circumstances, we would do well often to say, Lord, have I sinned? Where have I failed to obey your voice? And seek him for his grace. But here the people, how do they respond to the sermon? The answer is they don't respond. But God sets the wheels of deliverance in motion. He's going to intervene and act to deliver them despite their obedience. And it's not conditioned on their repentance. You see, this is how we're trained to expect, right? What do you expect? What do I expect? We expect, they'll say, oh, the people of Israel repented and they turned to the Lord. And then the Lord saved them. No, that's not what happens. The Lord acts to save not conditioned on whether they turn to him. Friends, the Lord doesn't come to save us after we turn it around and after we become better. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. No, God acts to deliver us while we're still in our sin. What a gracious God. While we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, Christ died for us. Well, that brings us to our next scene as God begins his work of deliverance. Scene two, the word that commissions. We saw first, we saw the word that corrects. Now we see the word that commissions. And all of our scenes, if you haven't figured it out, are structured around the word. Verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And when we read of the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, we should associate this character often, more often than not, with God himself. This is the presence of Yahweh, the living God, manifest in angelic form to deliver his word, all right? The angel of the Lord represents God himself. And he comes to this guy named Gideon, and what is Gideon doing? He's beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And right there, you should see, this is kind of a funny thing he's doing, all right? It's, it's counterproductive. What, what, do you, what do you mean by beating out wheat? How does that work? Now, I don't know anything about farming, so I'm dependent upon encyclopedias here. But apparently in the ancient world, in order to separate the shaft from the wheat, what they would do is they would kind of beat it and toss it up in the air, and the wind blows away the lighter shaft, and the heavier wheat falls to the ground. Now, where is the wine press located? Well, it's located underground, okay? So he's beating wheat underground where there's no wind, So he's accomplishing, this is like saying, hey, let's all get some fresh air. Let's go down to the basement hall. (laughs) That's what Gideon is doing. He's he's, he's scared. Because if he does it out in the open, what's going to happen? The Midianites are going to come and all his wheat is going to be gone. He is in a hole in the ground in fear. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, verse 12, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. What? You come to a guy who's hiding in the ground and say, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. This is like going down the street and you see a guy chopping shawarma on the roadside and you say, Oh, I've come to eat here, you magnificent gourmet chef. What does Gideon say? Well, Gideon gives him kind of a cheeky response, verse 13. Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. By the way, when Gideon calls him Lord, the first phrase, that's not like, He's using God's name. He says, please, my Lord, please, sir. Please, sir. Is the Lord really with us? Yahweh, is he really with us? Look at the questions he asked. Why is this happening to us? Where is this God that my fathers told me about? 
No, the Lord has forsaken us. It's so easy, isn't it, to blame our circumstances on God. To blame God for what we're going through as if he's forgotten, as if he's forsaken us, as if he's gone away, as if his promises aren't true, when the reason for our circumstances is often our own sin. That's the case here, and Gideon doesn't see it. And and, and then he says, look what he says. He said, where are all his wonderful deeds that our father recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? I've heard about this God. I've heard stories of him and his power, but I don't see anything he's doing. I've heard how he's acted over the years, but where is he now? Well, God is right there. And Gideon just doesn't have eyes to see it. And the Lord turned to him, verse 14, and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? Verse 15, he says, He said to him, Please, sir, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Gideon saying, like, Do you realize who you're talking to? He only sees his human resources. He does not realize who is speaking to him. Verse 16, the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. In other words, this vast horde of Midianite army, you're going to knock them down as if they're just one guy. Why? Because I will be with you. I love uh, this Bible teacher, Dale Ralph Davis. He says this, basically, God has nothing else or more to offer you. You can go through a lot with that promise. I will be with you. It does not answer your questions about details. Nothing about when or how or where or why. Only the who. I will be with you. And that is enough. Okay, now Gideon is curious. Now he's kind of like intrigued. Okay, let's find out a little bit more. Now, who is this guy? And he says he's with me and he's saying all of this stuff. I want to know. And he's going to ask for a sign. And here begins this kind of very unhealthy pattern that we see throughout the story of Gideon's life. You'll see it again and again. In fact, it's what leads to a very sorry and sad end to his life. So he says, show me a sign. Verse 17. And he said to him, if now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Unlike the fathers of old, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, they had no doubt who was speaking with them. They knew it was the Lord. Gideon is not so sure. He's not accustomed to the voice of God. So he says in verse 18, please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, that is the Lord said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour that's 22 liters of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented presented them. This again is humorous, right? I mean, think about it, God Almighty saying, I'll wait here for you. And he's right there waiting. Gideon goes home. He gets a go- This is not fast food, okay? You're cut, cutting up the goat, preparing it, getting the flour ready. Then you put it all in the basket, and he's coming back with his picnic basket. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Boom! Fire! Poof! The angel's gone. Gideon is like, wow! Amazing! Then Gideon perceived, verse 22, that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said... Here comes the scary guy. Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. He's panicked. He thinks he's going to die. Well, here, rightfully so. This is how any human creature should respond when face to face with the holiest being in the universe. 
But the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abizrites. Gideon recognizes he's speaking with a divine figure. And even as we are introduced to Gideon, we should pause and reflect upon this. Isn't it amazing how God chooses his servants? The least likely candidates for what he wants to accomplish. He comes to an old sterile man with a barren wife and says to him, I will make you the father of many nations. He chooses a man who is slow of speech and says, you will lead my people out of slavery and give them my law. He comes to Gideon the coward and calls him a mighty man of valor. He says to Peter the double-minded apostle, upon this rock I will build my church. He takes a ragtag group of weak flawed, fearful, frail sinners from many nations and says to them, you will be an embassy of my kingdom. Go in this your strength and make disciples of all nations. I am with you. God uses weak and fearful sinners for his glorious purposes. But before God can use Gideon to deliver Israel from the Midianites, first, Gideon must deal with with the idols in his own household. We've seen the word that corrects. We've seen the word that commissions. Now we come to scene three, the word that commands. Look at verse 25. That night the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due altar, then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. Surprise, surprise, idolatry is pervasive in the nation of Israel. So much so that this guy, Gideon, his dad, Joash, his household, has idols in their back- backyard. There's a big idol of Baal, and there's an idol of Asherah, Baal's consort, this evil sexualized false goddess of the Canaanites, in his dad's backyard. We just saw Gideon build an altar to the Lord, Now, he must go on God's command and tear down the altar to Baal that is in his house and build another altar there to the Lord. You cannot serve God while there are idols in your house. What does Gideon do? He boldly goes and obeys God's command, doesn't he? No, no. He's still afraid, verse 27. So Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him, but because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. So these are pretty big idols, right? He needs 10 servants, but look, the dude is still afraid because he needs to do it at night. He's like, if I do it in the day, they'll probably catch me. I'll go do it in secret. I'll do it at night. Ha, kind of scary cat obedience. Still obedience, he does it. What happens the next morning? Well, they figure things out pretty quickly. Verse 28, when the men of the town arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down and the Asherah beside it was cut down and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. One of those 10 servants probably ratted him out. Then the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. Isn't this just such a clear indication of how deeply idolatry and false religion has been entrenched in the people of God? They would not put to death those who blaspheme the God of Israel. Here they want to put to death somebody who's cut down the pagan idols. Some, they say, who has done this thing? Something massive has happened in our village. Somebody cut down the idols. 
All of these guys are so concerned about preserving the idolatry in their midst. And sometimes it can become like this among the people of God, brothers and sisters. Sometimes churches can become like this. Sometimes we can begin to guard the idols that we love more than obeying the God that saved us. Well, all of a sudden, there's a spark of light and a little bit of wisdom. Verse 31, what does Gideon's father say? Joash said to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal or will you save him? So Baal is a god, right? Are you going to fight for him? Are you going to be his savior? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. In other words, if Baal is God, I'm sure he can defend himself. Let's wait for him to do that. You're going to insult him by trying to act on his behalf. And then Gideon gets his new nickname. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubaal. That is to say, let Baal contend against him because he broke down his altar. Let Baal fight with him. What happens in Gideon's family is a word for all of the people of Israel in the midst of this. Who's it going to be? Who is God? Is Yahweh going to be your God? Or is Baal God? And the people of Israel wrestle with this question for centuries, you see. You come later to the book of 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18, and you have Elijah against the prophets of Baal as the whole nation has gone into this false worship of idols. And Elijah asks them, how long are you going to keep on limping between two opinions? That's what the people are doing here. Brothers and sisters, friends, are you limping between two opinions in your life? Are there idols, Baals, that have drawn your heart away from wholehearted devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ? I said, well, I'll have Jesus and I'll have my safety. I'll have Jesus and I'll have my security. I'll have Jesus and I'll have my career and my success and my perfect family. I'll have Jesus and I'll have my pornography. I'll have Jesus and I'll have this relationship. I'll have Jesus and I'll have sin. And Jesus comes to you and says, no, I demand all of you. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ and you've been coming here for a while and you've been listening, you've been reading the Bible and you've been hearing and seeing more of who the living God is, maybe you're limping between two opinions and you're not sure yet. And I want to call you to come to the living God, the only one who can save you. Well, Gideon does it in a fearful way, but he's obeyed God's word. He dealt with the idolatry in his own house. We can't serve God unless we deal with the idols in our lives and in our households. Well, now we should be ready for the battle to pick up, yes? Not yet. Scene four, the word that condescends. The word that condescends. Look at verses 33 and following. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. This is it. This is time. Here they've come. They're going to raise the land again, take away everything. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, we see the Spirit of God rush upon God's chosen servants, come upon them and empower them for particular tasks. And here God has chosen Gideon to be his deliverer. And the Spirit of the Lord clothes him. And what does he do? He sounded the trumpet and the Abizrites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh. And they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun and Naphtali. And they went up to meet him. God has stirred in the hearts of these people to recognize this man as his chosen deliverer and they're all assembling around him under his leadership to go out into battle. And so it's battle time, right? This is it. But wait, Mr. Gideon is not ready yet. He needs something more. Verses 36 and following. Then Gideon said to God, notice again, if, when God says go, it's never a good idea to say if. 
if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, All right, I now know that you are the Savior of Israel, and you have chosen me. We're going out into battle. No, that's not what he said. Let not your anger burn against me. Let me just speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. And what a poor example of how to interact with our covenant God who speaks so clearly and reveals himself unambiguously. This is a bad idea. God has already told Gideon in no uncertain terms what he's going to do. God has already spoken and told Gideon what Gideon must do. Gideon himself knows what God has said. Did you notice that in verse 36 and 37? If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. Notice in verse 37. Then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. No, what God says is not enough for our scaredy cat friend. He's begun to get hooked on superstition, on looking for extraordinary and supernatural signs rather than trusting the plainly revealed word of God. And like I said, at the end of this life, this gets into a lot of trouble. You'll see that next week. And sometimes, very often, I have seen Christians begin to take this kind of an approach. In fact, looking at Gideon's behavior here and thinking that this is a model for how we need to interact with God. Ever heard that? I oh, will put out a fleece and see what God says. Oh, I'm waiting for a sign to see what God does. I used to do that many years ago. I would know what the Lord wants me to do. It's clear in the Bible. I've received good counsel. It's all very clear. But I'm waiting. I'm just waiting for a sign. I'm just waiting for that one thing. I told God if he does this, then I'll do that. That's how I lived for several years. Oh, I'm just waiting for a dream. Oh, I'm just waiting for that person to wear a blue shirt, and then I'll know. Friends, God doesn't lead us that way. He speaks clearly. He reveals to us what he wants in his word. And he expects us to hear and obey him. Of course, God can sometimes lead us through our feelings, through our desires. But be careful about getting hooked on waiting for leadings from God. All right? And waiting for particular feelings before you obey what he's clearly already said. No, the best pathway to decision making is to obey the sufficient scripture that he has given us. Given us. All of scripture is profitable for all godliness. His clearly revealed word. God blesses us with pastors and elders and mature church members to give us good counsel and wisdom. He directs us through our circumstances and his gracious providence in our lives. And so there are much better pathways to decision making, wise decision making, than putting out fleeces and waiting for signs. But there's even more that's going on here that you maybe did not realize. Baal was the God of what? He was the God of rain and of dew. That's why in 1 Kings chapter 17, God uh, is judging Israel. He shuts up both rain and dew. So when Gideon is creating this test and asking God to interrupt the natural order and, and put the dew only on the fleece and keep it dry all around and then keep it dry on the fleece and make dew all around, he's testing, well, are you really God? Are you the one I should trust, or is Baal the lord of the dew? Gideon is still wavering. Gideon himself is still uncertain. Gideon himself is still limping between two different opinions. And yet God is so gracious. 
God is so kind. God is so overwhelmingly merciful to this cowardly, wavering, superstitious chicken of a man. He condescends to give him the sign that he needs. And he's done so with us, hasn't he? Friends, if you want to know the certainty of God's salvation, you don't need a fleece or any other sign. He has given us his clearly revealed word, and he's already condescended to us to give us the greatest sign imaginable, the cross and the empty tomb. No, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Gideon tested God. God graciously condescends and accommodates his request. And now Gideon is going to have a couple of tests of his own for his army before God leads him into battle. That brings us to scene five. We've seen the word that condescends, scene four. Scene five, the word that culls. The word that culls, C-U-L-L-S. If you don't know what that word means, you can look it up in a dictionary. It means shrinks down the population of something. To thin out population is called culling. Chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and encamped beside the spring of Harod. And the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. God knows the hearts of this people. God has seen them again and again experience his salvation and then turn away from him very quickly. God knows that if they experience victory here, they're going to say, oh, look at us. Aren't we great? Isn't that just such a proclivity for all of us? Where we think about how awesome we are and how great we are and how great things are happening through our ministry and how the Lord is using me or the Say the Lord is using me, but you're really thinking about you're using me. You're using yourself. We put the Lord out of the equation often, don't we? We become glory stealers. Well, the Lord will have none of that. Verse 3, Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. So Gideon himself has been kind of a fearful guy. Now he's going to the army and saying, Okay, if you're afraid, go home. 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. Can you imagine Gideon's face when this is happening? A few tears. What are we going to do? Uh, but then he may you know, like, oh yeah, I remember Mount Tabor, right? Deborah and Barak, they had 10,000. They didn't have weapons. And they were on top of the mountain and then they rushed down and God overcame the iron chariots of Sisera. 10,000 is okay. We'll, we'll be okay. Well, maybe you don't realize the odds here. The, the Midianite army, their size, if you go to chapter 8, actually tells us how many were there. 135,000, all right? We had 32,000. Now we're down to 10,000, less than one-third. Gideon's like, oh, okay, all right. It'll happen. The fleece was wet. God's going to do it. Like Barak at Mount Tabor. No, not yet. Verse 4. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. What? Take them down to the water. By the way, interestingly, the spring there, did you see the spring's name is Harad? Verse 1. Harad means trembling. All right, so whoever was fearful and trembling at the spring of trembling went home. And now they're going down to the spring of trembling with one more test. I will test them for you there, and of whom, anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. So separate these two groups, all right? We're going to call them the lappers and the kneelers, all right? The lappers are those who lap with their tongues like a dog laps. The kneelers are those who kneel down and, you know, do this, okay? And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men, but all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. And let all the others go every man to his home. Oh my goodness. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. 
You know, sometimes I've heard this passage preached, and I confess many, many years ago, I also taught this passage in this way, where this is the, te- the first test was God testing their fear. The second test is God testing their focus. And, and, and sometimes people will say, preachers will often say this, yeah, God is testing, you know, who's more alert and, and you know, careful and, and looking up to see if the enemy is coming as opposed to who is, you know, kind of just thirsty and diving into the water. Well, first of all, that's wrong because the guys who were kneeling and supposedly alert are the ones who were sent home, all right? Secondly, this is a completely arbitrary test. We have no idea why God separates them this way, all right? Nor do any of the interpreters of this passage. It's an arbitrary test. The test, the basis of the test is God's decision, I will say, this one shall go, and I will say, this one shall not go. And the guys who lapped were probably picked because they were the smaller number, 300. So 300 are going to go up against 135,000. Hey, I love cricket. JP and I, Pastor JP and I, are always keeping track of the score. India is playing England right now. The series is tied 1-1. All right, this is the third match, very crucial. And right in the middle of the match, one of India's star players... His game is evenly poised, had to go home for a family health emergency and can't play the rest of the game. And cricket doesn't allow substitutes. So now it's 10 against 11. And I sent Pastor JP a message saying, game over. Well, here, it's not just 10 against 11. It's 300 against 135,000. The ratio, my friends, is 1 to 450. God loves working with impossible circumstances. Moses, a weak, stuttering shepherd with his staff, standing before mighty Pharaoh, the most powerful king on the planet at the time. Elijah, God's prophet, standing against, as one man, standing against 450 of the prophets of Baal. The Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, hanging naked and ashamed on a cross. A little church in the capital city of the United Arab Emirates of 440 members. God ensures that he gets the glory for every victory. I want to ask you, are there circumstances in your life where you're relying upon your own strength, your own wisdom, your own resources, We can be tempted to think this way even when it comes to the local church. We often fall into this trap. We think that the church is doing great when we're strong in numbers, when attendance is high, when the budget is big, when when the big vision statement and all of these things. As a church, what are we relying upon? Or rather, who are we relying upon? May it always be nothing other than the power and might and wisdom of our sovereign, omnipotent God. And now we will see his sovereignty and his goodness and his wisdom and his strength and his might on full display as we come to the last scene in today's story. We've seen the word that corrects, the word that commissions, the word that commands, the word that culls in order that God gets the glory. And scene six, the word that conquers. Chapter 7, verse 9. That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. What are you expecting? Gideon and his army of 300 will go, and God will give them the victory. No, not yet. No, in fact, this is the fifth time in the story God has said, I will give Midian into your hand. This is the fifth time. And by now, God has become familiar with how our friend Gideon responds. So God preempts his response, verse 10. But if you are afraid to go down, which he is, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he, that is Gideon, went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay all along the valley like locusts in abundance, and the camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. 
And he said, it's like, hey, that's, that's what this word behold is supposed to, hey, I dreamed a dream. And behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned upside down so that the tent lay flat. So he has this weird dream, a big loaf of barley bread, moldy bread, rolling along and landing on their camp and turns flat, upside down and flat. And all of a sudden, his pagan comrade has the interpretation of the dream. This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. Wow! Finally, our chicken-hearted friend gets the picture. How does Gideon get convinced and persuaded? He's persuaded by one pagan's interpretation of another pagan's strange dream. That's what convinces Gideon. You know, there's an organization, praise God for this organization, called um, Gideon's International. And they talk about the Gideon's Bible, and some of you have served with them before. And they put New Testament, they want to put the written word of God uh, into as many hands as possible. Well, our friend Gideon believes anything but the Bible, right, here in this story. It's kind of funny that he's named Gideon. He doesn't trust God's clearly spoken word, even though God told him five times, I will deliver. What is he convinced by? Some Midianite's dream and the other guy's interpretation. God has to condescend to give Gideon what he needs. As one person put it, sadly, Gideon has become more dependent on extraordinary signs than he is on the clear commands of Yahweh. And like I said, next week when we look at chapter 8, you'll see it leads to great disaster in his life. Verse 15. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. Kind of a strange battle strategy. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. <laughs> and here you see another little character flaw that when we come back next week, you'll see ends in great tragedy. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him, came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. So here's the battle strategy. 135,000 Midianites, 300 men in three companies, trumpets, jars, torch inside the jar. All right, that's what they do. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow and they cried out a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. They don't have swords, okay? Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. There's confusion in the Midianite camp. They look at this in the darkness. They all of a sudden see themselves surrounded by these flickering lights. They hear this loud sound of a trumpet and these people shouting and they have no idea what's going on. When they blew the 300 trumpets, verse 22, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. God brings confusion upon them and they start killing each other. And the army fled as far as Bethshita towards Zerera, as far as the border of Abel Mehola by Tabat. What a stunning reversal. Bizarre strategy, amazing result because of an amazing God who is working sovereignly to bring about his victory for his glory. Verse 23, and the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and from Asher and from all Manasseh and they pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and capture the waters against them as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. What's the problem with that? Stop there and ask yourself, what's the problem with what Gideon just did? Don't forget, God whittled down his army to 300. And God said, that's all you need and that's all I want because I'm supposed to get the glory for this victory. What has Gideon done instead? 
he's once again increasing the size of his army by summoning others to join him. Not good. Not good. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they captured the waters as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan and they captured the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. It's funny, the story starts with the Israelites hiding in rocks and Gideon hiding in a winepress. The story ends with the Midianites being put to death in a rock and in a winepress. Then they pursued Midian and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. The battle will continue and be completed next week. <laughs> but the people of God have already won. I want to bring us back to our two principles that we must use when reading the book of Judges. We've talked about week after week. First, these things happen as examples for us. First Corinthians 10, Paul tells us. And in Gideon's life, first and foremost, we see a highly negative example. We see an example of someone who is superstitious and his superstition takes priority over the clearly revealed word of God. Friend, if we are to go and grow in confidence, there is no greater source of confidence than God's revealed and sufficient and powerful word. As Martin Luther once said, let the man who would hear God speak, read the holy scriptures. We see an example here of Gideon trusting supernatural signs and craving after superstitious things rather than trusting what God says. We also see a negative example of one who is wavering in his commitment, fearful, mixed in his faith. And we saw a little bit of his prideful self-centeredness when he says for the Lord and for Gideon. And you'll really see all of these things play out so tragically at the end of his life next week in chapter 8. He's a highly negative example for us not to follow. At the same time, he's a highly encouraging example, isn't he? This coward's life tells us that God still uses wavering, uncertain, fearful, flawed, frail people with mixed faith for his glory. And if he could use someone as messed up as Gideon with his faltering faith, oh brothers and sisters, he can use you and me. And if he could use Gideon's ragtag army of 300 lappers to overcome the mighty Midianites, he can use a church of ordinary people here in the Middle East to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and make disciples of all nations for the glory of his name. Our first principle is that these are examples for us. Our second principle is far more important and of greater consequence. Judges, like every book of the Bible, is a book of Christ-centered hope. Because you see Gideon in his role as a savior of God's people points us to the true and better Gideon. He points us to a far greater savior. And this savior like Gideon, seemed just as unlikely to be a savior. He came in total weakness. He came in total obscurity. He lacked status, was raised in an obscure town of Nazareth. He was born into lowly circumstances, born at a time when his people were far from God, but of him it was declared, he shall save my people from their sins. And this savior went up against enemies far greater than Midian. He went up against Satan, sin and death, not with 300, but alone. And unlike Gideon, and unlike you and me, he never feared. Unlike Gideon and unlike you and me, he always trusted God's word. He never put the Lord to the test. In fact, when he was tested, he repeatedly said again and again, it is written. And depended upon the revealed word of God. Unlike Gideon, he did not fail. 
in the most fearful and terrifying of circumstances, as he was facing the prospect of drinking the cup of God's wrath, as he sweat blood in the garden, he cried out, not my will, but yours be done. And he went to the cross. He took upon himself the penalty of sin that you and I deserve. He took upon himself the judgment of the wrath of God for sinners like you and me. And he was victorious. He defeated death. He rose again. And this Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, tears down the altar of sin in our lives. He has offered himself on the altar before God as the perfect sacrifice, not a goat, not a bull. He offered himself by his blood. He cleanses us from sin and he turns away God's wrath from us. And he promises us for all who trust him, I am with you. Go in this your strength and live for me. And friends, if you have never trusted him before, come today, come to this great and glorious Savior who is able to take the cowardly and make them courageous, who is able to take the weak and make them strong, who is able to take those who deserve death and give them eternal life and forgiveness of sins in his name. How do we cowards become courageous? The answer is the God of Gideon is our God. He is the God of the weak, the God of the fearful, the God who makes us strong so that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus our Lord. How do the wavering grow in confidence? Well, it's through the fact that God speaks to us through his certain word and he keeps every promise that he makes. As we look at insurmountable circumstances, as we experience trials on every side, as we face our own fears, our weaknesses, as we face perplexing odds, question for us is, do you trust that he is with you? And do you trust his word? You know, Gideon and his army, just think about this, they were standing around the Midianites with these jars, probably clay jars, and they smashed them, and the light that was inside scattered the Midianite army in fear. Think about 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Paul talks about the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, and he says, we carry this treasure in jars of clay. He is the God who shines the glory of the light of Jesus Christ through our lives, jars of clay that are broken for his glory. So whatever circumstance you're facing, consequences that might come for being public in your following of Christ and living your faith before others, the uncertainty of life in this region, whatever the future holds, when you're at your weakest or even most afraid, hear these words from our Lord Jesus Christ. I am with you always even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for so glorious a Savior and so great a salvation. May we live our lives in light of who Jesus is and what he's done and become more than conquerors in him. In Jesus' name, amen.